Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa liya salihin. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh qatam al-anbiya'i wa mursaleen. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala abdika wa rasulika muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Wa ba'd. All praises are due to Allah, Lord of the worlds. And surely Allah is the friend and protector of the righteous. I bear witness that Allah is one and that Muhammad is his servant and his last messenger. And may Allah always and constantly send peace and blessings to Muhammad, to his family, to his companions, to all those who call to his way. Establish his sunnah to the day of judgment. As to what follows, my beloved brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, it is a great privilege to be with you here. And I can only pray that Allah Azza wa Jal would bless this conference, would empower the activists in our community, and would give us success in this work and our struggle against poverty. And this subject is of such importance to me as an individual. I reflect on the words of Allah Azza wa Jal. And we all should as we talk about the issue of poverty. Allah tells us, A'udhu billahi minash shaytani rajeem, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amunu taqullaha wa qulu qawlan sadeeda, yuslih lakum a'malakum wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum, wa man yuti'illaha wa rasoola, faqad faza fawzan azeema. Allah tells us, O you who believe, have the consciousness of Allah and speak a straightforward word. He would repair your deeds, forgive you of your sins, and whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has surely gained a mighty triumph. And so I speak to you uh, with this spirit of qawl and sadida. Coming here to Connecticut for me is uh, a homecoming. And what I'm about to say is, in a sense, like a report back. Because um, contrary to what people may think, um, I was not born in the West Indies. I was not born in Canada. I was born in Massachusetts, in the Boston area in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I grew up in a housing project in Cambridge, in between two prestigious institutions, in between MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Harvard University, there, there was an island there, a working class neighborhood, where people were living in an area that's supposed to be prestigious, but yet they were not feeling the benefits of the wealth that was around them. And from a young age, I sensed the dichotomy. I, accent, I, I could sense the haves and the have-nots. And we should never forget, we should never forget as we are thinking about the 1%, the 99%, where do we stand as Muslims? What is happening in this country? We should never forget the trends, we should never forget what is going on outside of the walls of the masjids and our Islamic centers. And we need to be very sincere with each other, very straightforward, make practical resolutions, and make the intention to do work in the field. In the 60s, as a young African American, I spoke out with many people for civil rights. We wanted voting rights, we wanted education, we wanted uh, integration, we wanted to be part of the society, but our cries were met with repression. People were jailed, people were killed, and many were sent into exile. And when the 70s came, a war on drugs began in America. Our communities were flooded with drugs, crack cocaine. It did not come from inside the community, it originated outside and then flooded our communities and a war on, on, on drugs came, and now we see the result of this. We see that in America, 
recent studies have been done to show that there is a larger percentage of, of the black population in prison in America than in apartheid South Africa at the height of apartheid. The studies are also showing us that in the major cities, 80% of young African Americans have something to do, have some kind of criminal record, some relationship with the criminal uh, justice system. And so we find that the prisons are filled with black and brown people. And we should never forget this. And as a recent writer, Michelle Alexander, has written in her book, The New Jim Crow, that we are living in an age of mass incarceration, in an era of color blindness. Because our president is a person of color, people were told to be color blind. But what is happening behind this on the ground is mass incarceration. And we, we should never forget this when we are looking at the lands projecting toward the future. We should also never forget the First Nation population, the native people of these lands. Recently, I went on a journey north in Canada to a city called Iqaluit. Iqaluit is in the northern province of Nunavut. It is right near the Arctic Circle, next to Greenland. And there, alhamdulillah, there is a thriving Muslim community. We are putting up an Islamic center near the Arctic Circle amongst the Inuit people. And by the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal, an Inuit, an educated Inuit man came and said, I want to put the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into my language, inaktutak. This language was spoken in the Americas over 10,000 years ago. Not 300 years, not 600 years, 10,000 years ago. These are the lands that we are living in. And according to estimates even made by American scholars, one scholar in 1840, his name was George Catlin, he estimated that the Aboriginal population at the time of European contact was about 14 million. But by his time, by 1880, he estimated there's only 250,000 left. And people knew about this. Another writer, from the early times, his name was William Bradford. He described how the Dutch, who were the rivals of the people of Plymouth, they traveled to an Indian village in Connecticut. They traveled to an Indian village in Connecticut to do trade. And this is what he wrote in his journal. He said, but their enterprises failed. For it is pleasing to God to afflict the Indians with such a deadly disease and sickness that out of every 1,950 are dead. And they described here in New England going into villages and finding bodies piled up. And you go into the village and you, uh, the crops are outside, corn which is an American product, cranberries, squash, American products, turkey, an American bird. And they go inside and the, all the, the population has been decimated and they, thank, they are thanking God, making a thanksgiving and thanking God for clearing the land. But someone would say, well, that's the past and the past is gone. It's not gone. Recent studies have been done to show that the Aboriginal people, the native population, and again, if you're talking about 1%, 99%, you have to, we have to understand where we are. The Lakota people in Pine Ridge, South Dakota, it is reported that on their reservation, the life expectancy for a male is 48 years. It has also been shown very clearly this is the worst, this is the, this is the worst life expectancy in the whole of the Western Hemisphere except for Haiti. 
and this is in the United States. The Lakota, also in South Dakota, in their reservation, 60% of the houses have no running water and no electricity. So we should never forget about the Aboriginal people in these lands. And the Latino people also, who make up part of the Aboriginal population of this country that we are in. And how the Latino population suffered, came into these lands, not as economic immigrants trying to, to, to steal and gain a, a part of the American dream. How they came here, sometimes being forced to come and working in the factories, in the agriculture, prostitution, drugs, suffering on the borders. We should never forget the Latino population when we are talking about the Americas and the lands that we are living in. But with this in mind and with the background that I had thinking about these lands, I was not prepared for what I would see in Southern Africa. 10 years in the frontline states, and I report back to you that what is going on there, there is a horrendous relationship between the rich and the poor. South Africa is considered to be the, the most unjust place on earth. The frontline states, Zimbabwe, Malawi, Mozambique, Namibia, Botswana, Swaziland, Lesotho, as we traveled through these lands and lived with the people and experienced what they were experiencing, I cannot even describe to you. I had not seen it here in America. I never went to a reservation. But when I saw the Aboriginal people in Southern Africa, it is obscene to think that there are people living in uh, beautiful luxury homes and there are others who are suffering from poverty. Poverty will drive a person to do the strangest things. And in living in that environment, we also saw the beauty of, of Islam. The beauty that when uh, Islam is given to an individual properly, when the real sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu when his example is given, when the dignity of tahara is given to an individual, then we see how a person is raised from the horrible conditions of poverty, even though the material life still may continue to be destructive. And so we need practical solutions. And there in South Africa, we began a set of projects. We called it Masakani Community Center. And Masakani is not from Arabic. You might think it's Masakin, like the poor people's center. No, Masakani in Kosa, in the South African, one of the South African languages, means building community. It means cooperation. Cooperative projects were begun, a holistic approach was begun with the people there. This included not just feeding people, but teaching a person how to fish. Because we need to empower people. We need to realize that the food we are giving is just the beginning. It has to continue, and there has to be a, a, a process that the people go through. And we have a precedent for this. We have a precedent as Muslims, the Imara system. And the Islamic Imara system that we have, uh, you know, it, we should study this very deeply. I saw it in practice in Southern Africa. And if we study the Imara system of the Ottoman Turks that they put into practice between the 14th and the 19th century, then we can get practical uh, a guide, a practical guide and solutions to maybe what we can do to deal with this problem here. The Imara system was based on Oqaf. It was based on waqaf, that Muslims naturally give zakat, we give sadaqah, we also put waqaf, a trust. So the trust system was set up and pieces of land were designated by rich individuals or maybe it could be derelict land, unused land. And this land was uh, populated by a complex of buildings. The buildings included a masjid, madrasa, hospital, restaurants, 
bathhouse, a number of things could happen in this imara. But what is interesting about the system that was developed is that they were able to bring together welfare, education, prayer, housing, and, and commerce. And so on this land, business people were encouraged to come in and run their businesses on the land, and the businesses help to pay for the project so the project becomes sustainable. Because we need to have sustainability when we are dealing with this. And so, in a modern sense, in the short term, I want to propose to this conference that we begin to reanalyze and look at our centers and ourselves. That we need to start giving back. We need to give back not just with money, but with our skills. If you, if you, if you know engineering, if you know math, give back to the community. You can do it in the masjid. We can do it in the Islamic centers. We can begin to have tutorials. We, we can begin to empower the people who need, who, who need to come out of this devastation. We are about to go into an apocalypse. Many, many economists say that this country will, Iyadu Billah, if there is still inertia in the government, if we can't solve this economic crisis, then we may be like one of the third world countries by the year 2020. Thousands of homeless people around the major cities. Muslims are in a unique position. We have rich people, we have skilled people, we have poorer people, we're all in the same community. The Imara system encourages the rich that they should give their wealth and make waqaf, make a trust, buy a building. The business people come in, run your business, let it be sustainable. What do we do with the building? We have a masjid, we have a madrasa, but also we have education, skills development, skills training. And we have a food bank. We can have free medical clinic. Each area needs to do an assessment. A needs assessment needs to be done around your Islamic center to see what are the problems that the people are facing in your area. What also happens in the Imara system when it starts to develop, and this is the long term, is that they would even connect the uh, Imara uh, buildings, they would connect it with a bazaar, with a marketplace. And in this marketplace, you don't trade it with dollars and cents. You trade with tangible objects. You do bartering. It's the Islamic system. And so the time will come, and Allah knows best, when the US dollar is going to fall. This has happened all over the world. I saw it in the country of Zimbabwe, which used to be the crown of the British Empire. The Zimbabwean currency was the strongest in the whole of Africa. But when it was devalued, when crisis hit them, I wanted to spend $100 and I gave them $100 and they said they brought me back a bag full of money and they said, Brother Abdullah, you're now a millionaire. Because their currency was useless. Not even worth the paper that it's printed on. And so a barter system can also be developed. We are in a very unique position and we need to take advantages of this. Take advantage. We will seem strange when we do this. We will seem strange when we start teaching our young people how to grow crops, how to grow food, bring ourselves together with collective uh, uh, systems, credit unions together, unite ourselves as a community, put the waqaf towards for, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and enable the community that we can really enable the poorer people uh, in this land. We will seem very strange when we are doing this because we're not taking interest in usury. We're praying, we're fasting, we're reaching out. But I give you glad tidings for being strange. The Prophet ﷺ said in authentic hadith, Inna al-Islam bada'a gharibaan wa sayaudu gharibaan fa tuba lil ghuraba. Verily, Islam began strange, and it will return to being strange. So glad tidings to the strangers. And they asked him, O Messenger of Allah, who are the strangers? And he told them, Alladhina yuslihuna inda fasad nas They are those who repair themselves. They repair their community when the people have become corrupted. Sadaqa Rasulullah the time is here. 
And don't fear about the name of the Prophet ﷺ. Don't be afraid for his name. His honor and dignity is protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Musaylima, the false prophet, sent a message to the Prophet ﷺ saying, Min Musaylima Rasulullah, ila Muhammad Rasulullah. Imagine this. You take half of Arabia, I'll take the other half. How did he respond? He didn't kill the messenger. He didn't kill the ambassador. How did he respond? He wrote back, Min Muhammad Rasulullah ila Musaylima al kadhab And then with dignity, quoting from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet ﷺ answered with taqwa and patience, Inna al-arda lillahi yurithuha min yasha'u min ibadi wal aqibatu lil muttaqeen. This earth belongs to Allah and he will give it to whom he pleases from his slave servants and the best reward, the ultimate success is for those who have taqwa, those who have the consciousness of Allah. And so I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal would enable us to put our thoughts into action. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would enable us to develop a system to empower the people, the poor people in this land. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would unite our ranks, break down the differences between us. May Allah purify our hearts of all the bad thoughts and bad uh, concepts that are holding us back from uniting ourselves and dealing with our mission in this world, and that is to be the Khalifa. That is to be the Vicegent, the one who represents Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this earth. I leave you with these thoughts, and I ask Allah azza wa jal to have mercy on me and you, أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته